Math 242. Quest to College, I'm Joe Vasta. Let's go ahead and do some problems for review four. I'm going to go ahead and look at 6.2. We'll do a few of these from 6.2. Number four. So number four, they give you this logarithm. Um, one point log of 1.23 times 10 to the 37th power. And the instructions are expand the log and simplify. Now when they say expand the log, they do not want the argument to have a product, quotient, power, or root. And what we have is we have a power here, we also have a product. Um, since the whole thing is not raised to the 37th power. We are actually going to go ahead and use the product rule for logs. The product rule says, oh, by the way, the base on that log, it's not written there. Um, that's taken to be base 10. So this is going to be the log of 1.23 plus the log of 10 raised to the 37th power. Okay, so what are we going to do here? Log of um, 1.23, well that's log base 10, and there's no common base between 10 and 1.23, so there's nothing more we can do with that. Um, this is log base 10 of 10 to the 37th. And so what's going to happen on this one is this is going to be the property, I called it the popping property, where that thing goes pop. And you end up getting 37 for that part right there. So let's go ahead and write this down. This is log of 1.23 plus 37. And um, there's not much more we can do. We are done with that problem. Let's go ahead and do another problem. How about problem number 14, which looks a little bit more dramatic than the one we did. And it's the same instructions, expand the logarithm. So problem number 14 looks like this. Log base one half. The argument is four times the cube root of x squared this is all over y square root of z. So this one is pretty intense. I think what I see here, the big picture, is a quotient. <clears throat> so I'm going to go ahead and use the quotient rule. This is log base 1 half of 4 cube root of x squared minus log base one-half y times the square root of z. Okay, so now what we see here is we see that this is really a product of four times this, and then this is a product here, y times square root of z, so I'm going to use the product rule on both of those. So this one's going to be log base one-half of four plus log base one half of this creature right here and then we have this minus I'm going to use the um, product rule here log base one half of y and the product rule says you add them so I have plus log base one half the square root of z so well, some of you are like screaming out because because I did something wrong and I did something wrong on purpose because this is a common thing that happens on exams. So pause it if, and try to figure out what I did wrong. What is wrong going from year to year? <clears throat> and we'll fix it. Okay, so if we're going to fix that, we fix it by putting parentheses there because this is minus all of that. And this part right here became that. Okay. My next step is I'm going to go ahead and write log base one half of four plus log 
base one half, this guy I can write as a power. And we have the cube root, which roots go, grow underground, so they go on the bottom of the fraction on that exponent. So this is log base one half of x. So I have a one third on the bottom, and then I have a squared there. So this is going to be two thirds. And I'll distribute the negative. So minus log base one half of y, and then minus log base one half. And I'm going to do the same thing over here. I'm going to write that as um, there's some ink there, z raised to the one half power. Okay, so now I still have arguments that have powers, so I'm going to use the power rule. But I also have this right here. So I'm going to try to do this hopefully all in one, one thing. One half raised to what power gives you four? So, you know, you might remember us doing this in section 6.1. A log base one half of four equals, we'll use w, and I'll go, go ahead and change this to exponential form from Superman to Clark Kent. So this is one half raised to the w equals four. Is there a common base? We could have asked that question right here. Is there a common base between one half and four? And the answer is yes, the common base is two. So one half is two to the negative one and four is two squared. So this is two to the negative w equals two to the two. And so negative w equals two, and I'm kind of run out of space here. So you see that w is gonna equal negative two. And I should have left myself more space for that. So that's where I'm getting this one here. So log base one half of four happens to be negative two. And the rationale behind that is because negative, uh, sorry, one half raised to the negative two power is four. Now, if this had been a five, we wouldn't be able to do anything. We'd just keep it like that if that was a five in the argument. Okay, so we move on here with the power rule. The two thirds jumps out in front of the log. And that's just gonna be log base one half of X. And then this one, there's nothing we can do. That's a variable there. So I'm going to just write it as minus log base one half of y. And um, our last one, we're going to go ahead and make this exponent jump out front. So this is minus one half log base one half of z. So we look at these and there's not much more we can do to expand any of the logarithms. And we have our answer right here. This problem was a lot more dramatic than problem number four, and it should be because it's almost near the end of the grouping of those problems. Let's go ahead and do a few more problems in 6.2, and I'll put the 6.2 label here in case the papers get scrambled around when I'm PDFing them. Okay, so our next problem that we're gonna do 6.2, we'll do these kind here, number 20. <clears throat> and number 20 says, use the properties of logarithms to express as a single logarithm. And so here's number 20, it looks like. Log base three of X minus two log base three of Y. Okay, so I want to put those all into one log, and it looks like we can because there's threes there. And so what I'm going to use, well, it looks like we're going to use the quotient rule, but you can only use the quotient rule if there's ones in front of those logs, and there's a two there. So before I use the quotient rule, I'm going to make that two jump up and become the exponent of that argument. So I'm going to use the power rule. So this is log base three of x minus log base three of y squared. Okay, so um, we've done that using the power rule. Now I have a minus, there's ones in front of those logs. I'm gonna use the quotient rule. And when I use the quotient rule, I end up getting um, log, oh, 
hopefully I copy down the right problem. Um, no, I didn't copy down the right problem. That's all right. So what I ended up doing, because I kind of looked at that problem there. So it looks, apparently I'm going to do number 18. I don't know if I said that, so that's the problem that we're doing, number 18. Because, you know, just so you don't look back and wonder, where did this all come from? I am doing problem number 18. Um, hmm, that's good enough, okay? So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the quotient rule, and I'm going to get log base 3 of x over y squared. And so I use the quotient rule there. Let's go ahead and do another problem. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and do a problem from, from 6.2. This is 6.2, number 20. So let's do 20. And we end up getting, for our problem, 2 ln x minus 3 ln y minus 4 ln z. So before I do the quotient rule or you know, things like that. I'm going to go ahead and take those coefficients and move them up to become the powers. This is going to be ln x squared minus ln y cubed minus ln z to the fourth. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and use the quotient rule right there. This is going to give me ln x squared over y cubed minus ln of z to the fourth. Okay, I have another minus between those logs, and I can use the quotient rule because all of those logs have the same base, and when I do so, I'm going to divide. So I have ln x squared over y cubed divided by z to the fourth. Okay, that z to the fourth is really over one. And so I'm going to go ahead and do a copy dot flip. And um, this is going to give me the ln of x squared over y cubed. When you copy dot flip, you flip the bottom part, and that z to the fourth is going to be on the bottom. And so there is the answer to problem number 20. Let's continue and do more problems. One more of, of putting them all into one logarithm. And I think for that one we'll do um, problem number 28. So I'm trying to do the evens. This is 6.2. I have log base 2 of x plus log base 4 of x minus 1. And I'll make sure that I've written that correctly. And so what we're doing is we're trying to put those logs together. Now some people will just ignore the 2 and the 4 and they'll just use the product rule. But you can't use the product rule if those are different. So what I'm going to do on this one is I'm going to chain, do property 8, we were calling it property 8, change of base. And I'm going to change this base to base 2. So I'm keeping this guy, keeping him as he is, and changing this to base 2 is we go log base 2 over log base 2. So we can change it to whatever base we want. We could have actually changed this one to base 4, but we're changing this to base 2. And the thing that goes on the top is the thing that's up top the argument. The thing that goes on the bottom is the thing that's sort of below, which is the base. Okay, so that was the change of base. Now it looks like we can do something with this. 
log base 2 of 4. 2 to what power gives you 4? That would be 2 squared. So that red thing is going to become a 2. And we can go off to the side and go log base 2 of 4 equals w and continue that way if you'd like. So what we end up getting is log base 2 of x plus log base 2 of x minus 1. This is all over 2. Okay, so how am I supposed to put those logs together? Well, make the realization that when it's divided by 2, it's really multiplied by 1 half. So there's a 1 half right there. Log base 2 of x minus 1. So I think I have room right here. I'm going to go ahead and take that 1 half because I can't just use the product rule because there's a 1 half there. I'm going to jump it up there and make it become the exponent of that one right there. So we have log base 2 of x, which really has just been sitting there the whole time, like just watching the show. It's kind of a sad show to be watching. It's kind of like watching this video, really. It's pretty sad. And so the 1 half jumps up there. Now on the next um, step we can actually write that as the square root of x minus 1. We do not have to do that but all the cool people that's that's what they're doing. So um, let's go ahead and do the product rule. This is log base 2 of x times that. So you could just write that but I'm gonna go ahead and go with the cool people that were using radicals. And um, that's what I'm getting for my answer. And hopefully um, you're following along. So for the next, for the rest of them, every time I put up a problem, I'm not going to say this, and I had, didn't say this at the beginning. I'm going to start saying this. Um, I'd like you to actually pause the video and see if you can do the problem on your own. That will probably be better for you than just watching me do these videos. So. This is still 6.2. Since I've assigned some evens and odds, I'll just make one up for this. Um, I'm going to ask you to evaluate this log right here. Log base 5 of 90. And what does it say? Um, they ask you to do that in, in the book. Use the change of base formula. So evaluate this. And I would like 4 decimal places. So when I ask for four decimal places, that means you will be rounding. And so pause the video and see if you can do this and then unpause and then you'll see what I do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use property 8, which is the change of base. And on my calculator I have base E and base 10. So I'm going to use base E on this. I'm going to go ln and I'm going to do what I did in the last problem. So I'm going to go ln of something over ln of something else. And the thing that goes on the top is the 90. The thing that goes on the bottom is the 5. Now you probably won't be able to see this on the video. I'm going to go ln 90 divided by ln 5. And I end up getting, and I'm going to round this, 2.795, and then there's an 8 there, but there's an 8 after that, so this is going to be 5.9. Okay, so if I take 5 and raise it to the 2.7959 power, I'm going to get something that's really close to 90. And so that completes that problem there, which is not taken from the book, I just made that problem up. Let's go ahead and do some more problems. We're going to go off to the next section, 6.3. Turning the pages there. And um, let's see what we have here. Let's do another problem. Let's do problem number 18. So 6.3, number 18. And it looks like this 30. 
minus 6 e raised to the negative 0.1x equals 20. So we're going to solve, and you know, on the test I would say write your answer in terms of natural logs. So that's what we're going to do. So go ahead, pause the video, and see if you can do this, and, um, and then see if you get the right answer. I'll, I'm going to start doing it right now. So what I want to do when I solve this is I want to solve for that right there. You know, if this said 30 minus 6x equals 20, could we solve for that? And the answer is, yes, we can solve for that. How would we solve for that? We would first subtract 30 on both sides. So negative 6e to the negative 0.1x equals, so this is going to be negative 10. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to divide by negative 6 on both sides. I'm going to get e to the negative 0.1x equals negative 10 over negative 6. Now bring it over here so this is e to the negative 0.1x equals 10 sixths or 5 thirds. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ln both sides. ln of e raised to the negative 0.1x. This equals the ln of 5 thirds. What's going to happen on the left hand side is this thing is going to go pop using our properties of logs. It's really saying e to what power gives me e to the negative 0.1x, which is going to be negative 0.1x. That's the property. And this is going to equal um, ln 5 thirds. Okay, so really what we have here is we have negative one-tenth. That is 0.1, it's one-tenth, and you have a negative. X equals the ln of five-thirds. I'm going to multiply both sides of that equation by negative 10. So I'm going to get X equals negative 10 ln five-thirds. So I think the book, when they write their answer, they write it like this, and then they said, or, or it also equals 10 times the ln of 3 fifths. It's because they took the negative 1 there and jumped it up there. And then this was 5 thirds raised to the negative 1, and then they flipped it. But you don't have to worry about that on the test. This is a legitimate answer. So that completes number 18. Let's go ahead and do one more problem from 6.3. We'll go ahead and do number 26. So 6.3, 26, um, so 6.3, 6.2 uh, happens to be, you know, the properties of logs, quotient rule, product rule, um, pro product rule, change of base, and 6.3 is, is exponential equations. So number 26 looks like this. What does it look like? It looks like 3 raised to the x minus 1 equals 1 half raised to the x plus 5. Now if this was a type 1 exponential equation, you know, this was like a 3 and this was like a 1 third, we'd be able to do this without logarithms. But those bases, we can't get a common base for those bases. So what I'm going to start by doing on this one is I'm going to ln both sides. ln 3, and I'll, I'll just leave the parentheses off now on that x minus 1. This is going to be ln, I better keep them on this one, 1 half. And then we have x plus 5, I'll leave them off there. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the power rule on both sides of this equation. That's going to jump down right there, and this is going to jump down right there. So I'm going to write out something and it's not going to be correct and then I want you to figure out what's up with what I wrote down. I do this because I see people doing this on the exams. Okay, so what's wrong here? 
And what is wrong is this x minus 1 and this x plus 5 have to have parentheses. Okay, so I've given them parentheses. And now I'm going to solve for x. Now here's the deal. It's going to be pretty tedious to write the ln3 and the ln1 half many times. So I'm going to just let this guy equal a. I'm going to let this guy right here equal b. So and by doing that, I have x minus 1 times a equals x plus 5 times b. Okay, so that's going to, for me, that helps out a lot. I'm going to distribute the a and the b. So I have ax minus a equals bx plus 5b. And what I want to do is I want to get my x's, because that's what I'm trying to solve for. I want to get those creatures all on one side of the equation. Now, I'm going to go ahead and put them on the left side. ax minus bx. So there they are. I'll underline them in orange again. And which means I don't really want this guy on the left hand side because he doesn't have an x. I'm going to add a to both sides and this is going to be a plus 5b. So now that I have my x's on the left hand side, I'm going to factor out an x. Okay, so I almost have x by itself. Here's the x right there. I'm going to divide both sides by a minus b. So I'm going to have x equals a plus 5b all over a minus b. Okay, so the last thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and make my replacements of the a and the b. And I'll go back to black ink. So look at this. x equals a is ln3 plus 5b, which was ln1 half. This is all over a, which is ln3, minus ln1 half. I mean, you can use properties of logs to do things, but this is good enough for the answer. And so that completes problem number 26 from 6.3. We're going to move on to 6.4, which is log equations. And all this is is just a review. This is normally what we would do in class. We'd work out some problems. The only difference is in class you'd be asking certain problems. And some of you wouldn't. I mean, there's a few people that would ask the questions and everybody else would just copy it down. So, yeah, this is what we're doing here. So I'm moving over to 6.4. I'm going to old school. I've got the, the Dead Tree book here with me. And um, let's go ahead and do problem number 16. And hopefully, you know, like those other ones, that one I copied down wrong. Um, unless I delete it out of the video, I don't know what I'll do. Um, hopefully, I'll copy these things down correctly. So 6.416 says log. Oh, by the way, 6.4 is log equations. Log base 5. 2x plus 1 plus log base 5 of x plus 2 equals 1. Okay, so let's go ahead and see if we can solve this log equation. It is not a basic log equation. A basic one would say log of this equals a number. And we have two logs on the left-hand side. But what we can do is the product rule and get ourselves this log base 5 of 2x plus 1 and then this is x plus 2 this equals 1 so all I did was the product rule of logs now that I have a basic log equation I'm going to change this from log form to exponential form or going from Superman to Clark Kent the base is 5 the exponent is 1 and this equals the argument now some of you would have chosen to multiply the argument out before I did this step I'm gonna multiply it out now 
by doing a FOIL. So 5 equals 2x squared, and then outside is 4x, inside is x, so this is going to be plus 5x plus 2. So I'm going to go ahead and subtract 5 on both sides. And I'm going to get a minus 3 here. So hopefully this thing can factor um, uh, trinomial factoring. You could do the big X if you want. The numbers are kind of small, so I'm just going to go ahead and just plunge through this here. I think I'll put the 5 here and the 1 there, and that gives me a 5 and a 2. Oh, what am I doing? <laughs> Maybe I should have done the big X. Um, okay. So it looks like I'm doing guess and check. But <laughs> Remember, we said there was nothing guessing about this. So 3 and 2, which gives me... Um, ah, <laughs> so, wow. This is, this is terrible. Okay. Okay, so we have the white out. And, okay, so I'm going to put a 3 here <laughs> and a 1 there. Okay, so that did look like I was guessing and checking. Um, I don't know. It's, it's a Sunday afternoon, so my brain is not all there. But let's go ahead and continue. I'm going to put a plus there and a minus there. Okay, so let, we better just check this. 6x minus x is 5x. And Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to set each of those um, factors equal to zero. So this one gives me x equals one half, and this one gives me x equals negative three. Now with log equations, you have to check to make sure none of these um, answers are extraneous solutions. And in class, we were, I don't know if we ever did this in class, no. So I sometimes call these terrorists if, if they destroy the arguments of your original equation. So like one half, when I put it up there, I end up getting a positive argument. Two times one half plus one, that's positive. And then one half plus two is positive. This is a good guy. Now it could be the case that both of them are good guys, but I have a bad feeling about this. Not trying to steal lines from Star Wars movies, but if you put negative three in here, you get an argument that's a negative number that blows up the log that guy is a terrorist and so the only one that we're gonna keep for this one is x equals one half that is the answer to problem number 16 and um, an example where we had to throw away one of our um, extraneous solutions they called it let's go ahead and do another problem 6.4 This is going to be, let's see, maybe number 20. Okay, number 20 looks pretty, pretty nasty. So log of x minus log of 2 equals log of x plus 8 minus log of x plus 2. Okay, the base on the log, since it's not really written there, is base 10. Um, let's try to make it into a basic log equation. So I'm going to turn the left-hand side. I'm going to use the quotient rule to turn that into one log. So this is log of x over 2. Meanwhile, on the right-hand side, I'm going to go ahead and do the quotient rule there. So this is going to give me the log of x plus 8 divided by x plus 2. Now I have log of this equals log of that, and they have the same base. So because of the one-to-one -one property of logarithms, I'm going to set the this equal to the that. And then we'll finish off the problem that way. I'm going to cross multiply. Or you could say I'm multiplying by the LCD of 2 times x plus 2. In any case, I'm going to get x times x plus 2 equals 2 times x plus 8. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and distribute on both sides. So this is x squared plus 2x. This gives me 2x plus 16. 
um, I'm going to go ahead and subtract um, subtract the 2x on both sides and when I do that that's going to be kind of cool because those two x's are out of there so I'm going to get x squared equals 16 I could either bring the 16 to the left hand side and factor or use the square root property and get x equals plus or minus 4 so I, it looks like I have two solutions x equals 4 x equals negative 4 let's see if any of them are terrorists if I put 4 in there that's positive argument over here it's 4 plus 8 which is 12 positive positive argument and then over here the argument there is 6 so it looks like 4 is a good guy negative 4 kaboom there goes that structure just blew it up so we don't even have to check the other arguments we have a, a negative 4 in that argument that guy's a terrorist now I just randomly picked 16 and 20 to work out you're not always going to get one and throw the other one away sometimes you keep both of them sometimes you throw all your solutions away and you end up getting no solution I'll put a little check mark here just to show you that like I checked it okay let's go ahead and do 6.5 6.5 was the applications of of what we're doing here log functions exponential functions and so I'm just gonna lift this problem from somewhere random I'm not gonna tell you where I'm lifting it from maybe you can find out um, we're gonna say suppose two thousand dollars is invested into an account which offers 7.125% in terms of, okay, so this is a bank account, and this is compounded monthly. So the first part of this question is express the amount express the amount in terms of t okay so we're going to write a equals and then it's going to have the amount in terms of t well it just so happens i mean if we were meeting face to face i would say that i would give you these formulas but because this is weird times and it's open book open no not so this is the formula you would use when we are compounding it monthly when you compound it continuously then it's the PERT formula but it, this one's gonna look like this P 1 plus R over N to the N T power okay so let's see what we have here do we know what P is going to be yeah P is the principal so we're going to put that right there do we know what R is so lots of times people make the mistake and they say oh this is R and it kind of is it is but we don't want to write it as a percent so R is going to equal um, 0 0.07125 percent so that's what R is so they they pretty much gave us r but we don't want to put the percent into the formula okay we use green here n what is n and we have another occurrence of n right there n we get from compounded monthly that's how many times we compound a year so this is going to be 12. and then t is a variable so let's see if we can write this down here this is going to be the principal which is 2000 and we have 1 plus 0 0.07125 divided by 12 this is raised to the 12 t power okay so i'm going to go ahead and do this part in my calculator 1 plus 0 0.07125 divided by 12 
And so what I'm getting here is a of t equals 2,000 times, and I did this in the calculator, I'm getting 1.00598. This is raised to the 12 t power. And so when they ask us to express the amount in terms of t, that's the answer. The next question will ask, um, how much is in the account after five years? How much money after five years? Okay, so what we're going to do is they give us time, which is t, we are going to plug it into this function. So a of 5, and we put a 5 in for t, plug it in there, and we are going to approximate our answer to the nearest penny. And so what I'm getting is I'm getting 2,852 dollars and 92 cents. So that's how much money is in the bank account after five years. So it did make some money, but the interest rate was pretty high. The interest rates are pretty low nowadays. Let's do one more that is like, that comes off of this problem here. Better keep the formula there. Part C says, um, how long will it take to double? Okay, so um, we have our formula here. So let's, um, we know that in five years it didn't double the money. It doubles the money when the amount is not 2,000, but when the amount gets up to 4,000. So they're basically telling us the amount is 4,000. What is T? Because they're saying how long, that's a time. So I'm gonna plug, you know, this right here, just circle it in orange. This could just be written as an A there. So I'm gonna put A equals 4,000 into that orange thing. This equals 2,000 times this crazy number here, which I'm getting tired of writing down, to the 12t power. So what we have here is we have an exponential equation, and we're going to solve for this. And we'll round our answer to two decimal places. So two decimal places. Your book doesn't always tell you. So, let's see how long it takes to double. Okay, I'm going to solve for t. I don't want to ln both sides now because I have this 2,000 here, so I'm going to divide both sides by 2,000. So this gives me 2 equals um, 1.00593. Um, 7, 5 to the 12t power. I'm going to ln both sides now. Such a long number to write out. 12t. I'm going to go ahead and take that 12t using the power rule of logarithms and jump it in front of the logarithm. So I have ln2 equals 12t times the ln of this. And now I'm trying to solve for t. I'm trying to get t all by itself. So I'm going to divide both sides by 12 and by the ln of 1 point, you know, you see it. I'm not going to say it. So I'm, I'm going to end up getting t equals the ln of 2 all over 12 times the ln 1.0059375.
So I'm going to put that in my calculator. L. So it looks like I'm getting 9.75. Um, so T is 9.75723, etc. So when I round that, T is going to be approximately 9.76. And then, of course, this is years. So that's how you complete that problem. Okay, let's go ahead and do another one of these kinds of problems. I'm going to grab this from a calculus book. So we are doing a problem from a calculus book. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, how can that be? We're in pre-calculus, but I'm going to just show you. Here's a calculus problem right here. And it, well, we're not going to do the calculus behind this. So we have bacteria. And what your book's going to um, say is it follows the law of uninhibited growth. That's the exponential growth that we've been doing. And um, so it's going to follow this model right here. N of T equals and not E to the KT. So that's what it follows, that model there. And so what does it say? It says a bacteria culture initially contains, so initially contains 100 cells. And it, it follows the um, un, uninhibited growth or the exponential growth. And after an hour, after one hour you come back and you look and there are 420 cells okay so for part a they want you to find the growth constant find the growth constant and we you know the growth constant actually is K so how am I going to do that well initially so this is really you know we know that when T is 0 N is going to be 100 but this also right here this is your initial population which goes right here at the end not so we have this, and I'll just write it as n. n equals 100 e raised to the kt power. Well, over here it says when t is 1, and I guess our time is measured in hours, um, the population then is 420. So this gives us a t and an n value. We're going to plug that in there and find out what k is. So n is 420. We have 100 E, and we raise it to the K times T, so K times 1. So I'm going to divide both sides by 100. I'm going to get 42 over 10, or actually I can do better than that. This is E to the K. So E to the K equals 21 over 5. I'm going to ln both sides, the ln of e to the k equals the ln of 21 over 5. That thing goes pop and I get k equals the ln of 21 over 5. We're going to round to four decimal places. And so we found it, but um, I'm going to enter this into the calculator, ln of 21 divided by 5. And so this gives me k is approximately equal to 1.435, and then it says 0, 08, so 4351. And so there is the growth constant.
part B on this one asks us to find the formula. You know, find an expression for the number of bacteria in t hours. So find the formula. And the formula is really, where is it? It's basically right here. Except now we know what k is. So our formula is going to be n equals 100 e raised to the kt power. So 1.4351t. Part C says find the number of bacteria after three hours. And this is going to be pretty simple to do, so we don't need all that anymore. I'm going to go ahead and use this formula, and they give me this guy right here is a T. I'm going to go N of 3, because that really could say N of T there. And so when I do that, I get 100 E raised to the 1.4351 times 3. I'm going to round to the nearest bacteria. Seems reasonable, I guess. And um, I'm doing this on my calculator, so I have 3 times 1.4. Four, three, five, one, and so I'm getting quite a lot. I'm getting seven four oh nine point one. So that rounds to the nearest whole number is going to be seven thousand four hundred nine. So that's the number of bacteria after three hours. This is growing pretty quickly. And part D is when will the population of the bacteria reach 10,000. So the funny part about this is I am pulling this right from a calculus book and uh, here we are in pre-calculus doing a problem from the calculus book. Um, so now I'm going to use this formula here and instead of giving me a time they gave me the number. So I'm going to go ahead and write this 10,000 right there. I'm rewriting this formula. I'm putting the 10,000 in for n. This equals 100 e raised to the 1.4351 times t. I'm going to divide both sides by 100 and that's actually a 10,000 divided by 100 is going to be 100 equals e to the 1.4351t. I'm going to ln both sides. I have ln 100 equals ln e to the 1.4351t. And on the right hand side, that thing's going to go pop because the base on that log is an e. So we're almost done here. So I'm going to get ln 100 equals 1.4351t. I'm going to divide both sides by 1.4351 and I'm going to end up getting t equals the ln of 100 divided by 1.4351 in which I'm going to finish this up on my calculator divided by 1.4351. I'm going to round, you know, we'll just do one decimal place here. So on the test I'll tell you where to round when I ask you to round. So t is going to be 3.2 and the time in this was actually hours. So 3.2 hours the bacteria will reach a number of 10,000. And we only started off with 100 cells. 
So this does happen, you know, I mean, not all growth models follow the exponential growth model, um, but some of them do. So, okay, so let's turn our attention to um, the next chapter, which is conic sections. Um, in conic sections, I'm going to do a few problems from 7.5, and you may have noticed that 7.1 was missing from the sections we're covering on the test. 7.1 was just an intro and there was no homework. So the reason I'm pulling from 7.5 because near the end they had some that I did not assign like number 19 and 20 and actually I'm going to do I'm going to do number 20 first in 7.5 and that's going to have to do with a circle. So 7.5 number 20 has to do with a circle, and circles were covered in 7.2. Okay, so if you're confused, let's just continue with this. We have x squared plus y squared minus 8x plus 4y plus 11 equals 0. So what, there's a few questions we can ask. One is to put this in standard form. Another one is to find the radius, find the center, and even graph it. So that's what we'll do. How do I put this in standard form? I'm gonna complete the square. To complete the square, I put my x's together, leave a space, put my y's together, leave a space, and then put the um, negative, put the 11 on the other side, so it's going to be negative 11. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and take that negative 8, chop it in half, and square it. So this is negative 4 squared, which is 16. So 16 is the magic number I'm going to add right there. I'm also going to add it on that side. I'm going to do the same thing with the y's. I'm going to take that 4, chop it in half, and square it. So 4 divided by 2 is 2. 2 squared is 4. So I end up with 4 again. That's my magic number. I'm going to add that right there. I'm going to add it to the right hand side as well. So this right here is a perfect square now and it happens to be x um, minus 4 quantity squared plus this one right here is y um, plus 2 quantity squared and then over here we have 16 minus 11, which is 5 plus 4 is 9. So there is the standard equation of this circle. It has a center of 4, negative 2. Okay, so we get that from there. And then the radius, lots of times people mess this one up. They, they either say 9 is the radius or sometimes people will say oh 81 is the radius but it's this is really you know we have the form that says r squared is right there so the radius happens to be 3. And so that completes that. There's one other thing we want to do. We want to make sure we know how to do and that is to graph this circle. So this is actually not going to be that bad. I'm going to put the graph right here. And let's see, it should be down there a little. So it has the center. Here's x, here's y. This is number 20. It has the center of 4, negative 2. So x marks the spot right here. And then I'm going to count three out all directions. So one, two, three, put a point. One, two, three, put a point. One, two, three, we put a point down there. That looks like negative five. One, two, three. And then I go ahead and try to draw the circle the best that I could here. There's the circle. Okay, so that completes number 20. Graphing some circles which covers 7.2. Number 19 is a parabola which covers 7.3. So let's take a look at this parabola here. 
it looks like this x squared minus 2x minus 4y minus 11 equals 0. Okay, so what I want to do with the parabola, I'm only going to have one of the letters that are squared, and that's what I have here. I have an x squared, so I'm going to leave all the x's on the left hand side of the equation, leave a space, put in equals, and I'm going to put the y's on the right hand side. So I'm going to go ahead and say 4y and then the constant as well, plus 11. I'm going to go ahead and complete the square here. I'm going to take that negative 2, chop it in half, and square it. So this is negative 1 squared, which is 1, which is the magic number. I add one there and I add one there. So on the left hand side I end up getting x minus 1 quantity squared and on the right hand side I end up getting 4y plus 12. Okay, This is still not in standard form. To put it in standard form we need to um, factor a number out so you just have y on its own and I'm going to factor a 4 out. So I have x minus 1 quantity squared equals 4 and then we have y plus 3. Okay so with parabolas this is the standard form of the parabola. They're going to ask us to find the vertex, the focus, the directrix, and the endpoints of the lattice rectum. And then they're also going to ask us to graph. So let's just do some of this right now. I mean, do we know what the vertex is? The vertex happens to be 1, comma, negative 3. And so that is what it is. And we know that this number right here is always going to be 4p. So 4p equals 4, p equals 1. This parabola opens, well, because it's an x squared, it's either going to open up or down. Because p is positive, it's going to open. So this opens up. So I think the next thing I'm going to do with this is um, try to put up some sort of sloppy graph here. So we have this some grid paper here and um, let's go ahead and graph this. The vertex is 1, negative 3, so okay. I'm going to go ahead and put this right here. And put this right there. So here's x and here's y. The vertex is 1 negative 3. So there's the vertex. Okay, we know this is opening up and we know that p equals 1. So what p is is the directed distance from the vertex to the focus. So you're going to go 1 up and you're going to make a little star there. That right there happens to be the focus. So what is the focus? Let's focus on the focus. Uh, if this is going to be 1 negative 2. Now you go p in one direction from the vertex that gives us the focus. You go p in the opposite direction it, it puts a point right here but this point's going to be on something called the directrix and the directrix looks like this. Okay, so when they ask us for the directrix what is the equation of this line? So this is like negative 2, negative 3, negative 4 line, and it's horizontal. It's going to be <coughs> y equals negative 4, and that happens to be the directrix. The last thing we want to do is the endpoints of the lattice rectum, which happens to be um, parallel to the directrix and going through the focus. And that's going to help us draw our parabola really nicely. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to say that the focal diameter is always going to be the absolute value of this number here, 4. Okay, so the focal diameter is absolute value of 4, which is 4. 
So I'm not going to count out 4 to the right and 4 to the left because that would give me a focal diameter of 8. I'm going to count out 2 to the right and 2 to the left. So 1, 2, and that's going to give me a focal diameter. The focal diameter is the measurement of the lattice rectum. And so there it is. There's three dots. I'm going to go ahead and draw. Well, let's put the endpoints here. Sometimes we call these the endpoints of the focal of the lattice rectum. And that would be, so this is one, two, three, would be three, negative two. So three, negative two. And the other one would be negative one, negative two. And so let's go ahead and draw that parabola. At this point, we haven't been so concerned about what the intercepts are. We can find them, but um, I figured this is enough trauma. So that covers um, a bit of 7.3 parabola. Let's go ahead and do the next one, which would be ellipses. So that's what I'm going to cover now. All we're doing is just some sample problems. And maybe, hopefully, you're pausing the videos when I put up the problems and seeing if you can do these on your own. So this is still 7.5. I'm just grabbing problems from 7.5 part that I didn't assign. Here is 21, which is going to cover ellipses. And so this is 7.4. And the problem looks like this. 9x squared plus 4y squared minus 36x plus 24y plus 36 equals 0. So what we want to do with this ellipse is we want to put it in standard form and then I'll just verbally say what I'm going to write down. I want to find the center, the line that contains the major axis, the line that contains the minor axis, the vertices, the co-vertices, the foci, and the eccentricity. So that's what I'm going to find on this. And I'm also going to graph it. So before I do all that stuff, what I want to do is I want to go ahead and complete the square. Put my x's together. Leave a space. Put my y's together. leave a space, and throw the 36 on the other side, so it's going to be negative 36. Okay, to complete the square on the x's, um, I'm not going to do the magic number yet. I have to factor out a 9. So this is going to be 9 times x squared minus 4x. Leave a space within the parentheses. On this one, I'm going to factor out a 4. Now I have a y squared plus 6y. Leave a space. And this is negative 36. The reason I did that is in order to complete the square, you need a 1 in front of the x squared and a 1 in front of the y squared. So let's go ahead and take that negative 4 and square it. No, chop it in half and square it. So when I chop it in half, that gives me negative 2. Negative 2 squared is 4. So I'm going to add 4 here. And be careful, we didn't just add 4 to the left-hand side, we added 36. So I'm going to add 36 to the right-hand side. I'm going to go ahead and compute the magic number here. I'm going to take 6, chop it in half, square it. 6 divided by 2 is 3. 3 squared is 9. So you add 9 here. And we're not going to just add 9 here. We actually added another 36, so I'm going to add 36 there. Okay, so this becomes 9, and then we have x minus 2, quantity squared. This is plus 4. This is y plus 3, quantity squared. And this equals, well, those guys cancel, and you have a 36. It's still not in standard form because you have to divide everything by 36. So we're going to get what? We're going to get this. We're going to get x minus 2 squared over 4 
plus y plus 3 squared over 9. This is going to equal 1. There's the standard form equation, or the equation in standard form of this ellipse. So what are some of the things that I said we had to find? We had to find the center. So what is the center? The center happens to be 2, negative 3. Now before I find all the other things, I'm going to graph this. Before I graph it, I'm going to identify the this number 4 as a squared. So a squared equals 4, a equals 2. This guy right here is b squared, b squared equals 9, b equals 3. And so that's going to help me graph this. Go ahead and graph this here. So it looks like the center is 2, negative 3. I'm going to go like this right here. Graph right. So here's x, here's y. The center is 2, negative 3. x marks the spot. And so I'll put a negative 3 here and a 2 there. And um, A equals 2 is always going to be the horizontal run from the center. So I'm going to run 2 to the right, put a dot. 2 to the left, put a dot. And then over here I'm going to run 3 up, put a dot. And 3 down, put a dot. I'm going to connect those dots. Whoa. And get myself an ellipse there. So there's the ellipse. And it has some characteristics. I forgot what colors I used when I did lecture. But this guy right here is the major axis. It's the longest axis. And then this, this guy right here is the minor axis. So, you know, I think I'll line this up exactly with how I asked it in the, in the um, lecture. The center is 2, negative 3. The line that contains the major axis, that would be the line that contains that blue line segment, that would be x equals 2. Part C is the line that contains the minor axis. The line that contains that line segment is a horizontal line. It's going to be y equals negative 3. Um, part D says, what are the vertices? The vertices happen to be these guys right here. So the vertices are 2, comma, 0, and... This one right here, 1, 2, 3, this, is, this goes down to negative 6. So it's going to be negative 6, comma, 0. Um, part E asks for the endpoints of the, the minor axis, or another way of writing it is the covertices. The covertices are right here and right here. The ends of the red line segment, so that would be 0, negative 3, and the other one right here would be 4, negative 3. Okay, part F asked for the foci. Okay, the foci, you need to find letter C. And there's a Pythagorean equation. And the top dog is always going to be the bigger one of the a and b. So the top dog is actually going to be b. So b squared equals a squared plus c squared. Now in terms of hyperbolas, the top dog is always going to be c. But in ellipses, it's either going to be a or b. So I have 9 equals 4 plus c squared. c squared equals 
5. So c is going to equal root 5. So you're going to go root 5, which is a little after 2, up on the major axis. And I mean, you can't see that star there. There's one of the foci, and the other foci is going to be down here. But they're going to share the same x value, which is 2. The same x value as the center, which is 2. And then the y value is going to be negative 3 plus or minus root 5. Okay, the last thing that we want to find is the eccentricity. The eccentricity happens to be C over the top dog. And who was the top dog? The top dog was B. Now, it will change whoever the top dog is. If the top dog was A, then it would be C over A. So C is the square root of 5, and B is 3. And this eccentricity is always going to be between 0 and 1. The more close, the closer it is to 1, the more this thing's going to be flat. The closer this is to 0, the more this is going to look like a circle. Um, we don't have to do this, but I'm just seeing what it is. Divided by 3. It's 0.745. So this is 0.745, which means, yeah, what, whatever. I mean, you, it doesn't really mean too much unless you're doing the eccentricity of several of them, or you're looking at the eccentricity of the orbits of the planets, and then all of a sudden the math that we're learning in this class is interesting. Or maybe I'm just lying and it will never be interesting. So that completes an ellipse. We pretty much answered the questions that we answered in the notes. I'm following the notes here where I'm asking A, B, C, D, E, F, G. <laughs> this is an E here because I said it, okay, so that is the ex, the eccentricity, but this is in terms of the um, what I'm asking you. <laughs> this was part G. Sorry, so that was part G. Let me just correct that. Okay, so that's number 21 in 7.5, which covered an ellipse from 7.4. Let's go ahead and cover hyperbolas now. So we have 7.5. This is 22 it's hyperbolas. Which is actually 7.5. And um, let's go ahead and put up this equation here. 9x squared minus 4y squared minus 36x minus 24y. Kind of looks like the last one except there's some negatives and positives are switched around and then, and then um, we have a minus 36. This equals 0. So let me just check that I wrote this down correctly because it's kind of the same as the, the last one we did. So here is an equation of a hyperbola. What, I'm, what are we going to do in this problem? We are going to put this equation in standard form. We are going to graph this find the center, find the line that contains the transverse axis, find the line that contains the conjugate axis, find the vertices, find the foci, find the equations of the asymptotes. That's a lot of stuff. Let's go ahead and do this problem here. I'm going to group the axes together, leave a space, group the y's together, leave a space, and then um, I'm going to put the 36 on the other side, the negative 36. So it's going to become 36. I'm going to factor a 9 out of the first two there. So I have x squared minus 9x minus 9x minus 4x. Oh, no, that's smeared. Oh, well, it's going to be all right. And then um, leave a space, put the parentheses, and I'm going to factor a negative 4 out of those. So minus 4. We have y squared plus a 6y, leave a space, parenthesis equals 36. Okay, so now um, what I have here, it kind of reminds me of the last problem, because yes, those, those are the last, you know, I mean, it's not exactly the same as the last problem, but I have a negative 4, and I'm trying to find the magic number, so you might look back and see this is kind of what I have written down negative 2 squared, which is 4. So I'm going to add 4 here. And I'm not going to add 4 here. I'm going to add a 36. 
So I'm going to add a 36 there. Okay, so it wasn't exactly the same as the other problem because I think there was a negative 36 here. So, I mean, it was just the way the problem was written. It was very similar, but a little different. Okay, I'm going to go find the magic number here. I'm going to take 6, divide it by 2, and square it. So this is 3 squared, which is 9. I'm going to add 9 there, which really, what did I do? I subtracted a 36, so I'm going to subtract 36 on the right-hand side. Those guys are out of there. So I have 9, and then we have x minus 2 quantity squared. And then we have minus 4 y plus 3 quantity squared. This equals 36. Okay, I'm going to divide everything by 36 to put it into standard form. I'm going to write a little, little lower here. So I have x minus 2 quantity squared all over 4 minus y plus 3 quantity squared all over 9. This equals 1. Here's the standard form. And so there it is. And now we have to graph it. And I'm looking back at number 21. So here's 21. Look at that. Those are almost identical except this plus is now a minus. And maybe this is good because it's going to show us how changing a plus to a minus changes a lot of things. Okay. So part A, they ask us to find the center. Okay, the center is going to be 2 comma negative 3. So there's the center. Now be careful because, you know, if the x term is over here and the y term is over here, sometimes people will say the wrong center. They'll have the x and y change around. So the x coordinate of the center always comes from this x part and the y coordinate of the center always comes from the y part. Okay. Well, we also know that a squared is married to x squared. So a squared is 4 and a is 2. B squared is 9 and B is 3. Okay, so let's get some grid paper and graph this. We can graph this at this moment. And so, this graph, a lot of it is going to be in the fourth quadrant. So I'm going to go like this. So here's x, here's y, and the center is 2, negative 3. So 2, negative 3, x marks the spot. Okay, making sure everything is clear there. So I'm going to do my horizontal run of 2. I'm going to run over 2 this way, put a dot there, 2 this way, put a dot there, 3 up, 3 down, which this takes me to negative 6. And then instead of drawing in the ellipse, I'm going to draw a guide rectangle. A little sloppier this time about it. There's my guide rectangle. The guide rectangle is going to help guide me. <laughs> Um, it's going to help me draw the asymptotes. So there's one right there. And then the other one's right here. And it goes up like this. Okay, one thing that we could say from this is um, x is the positive one. And so this is going to remind me of the x-axis, which opens, which goes left and right. So this is going to open left, right. Okay, it's, now, if the y squared was positive and the x squared was negative, it would open up, down. So I'm going to go finish this graph right here. there's the hyperbola. Now um, we have some questions to answer. Before we answer the questions, we have um, the line segment that connects the vertices. That's called 
the transverse axis. This line segment right here, that's called the conjugate axis. So, you know, I'm using the same instructions that I used in my lecture. Um, a was find the center. B was find the line that contains the transverse axis, and the line that contains the transverse axis is y equals negative 3. The line that contains the conjugate axis, that's this red line segment, is going to be x equals 2. The vertices, well we already have them drawn, they're right here and right here. So the vertices happen to be 0, negative 3, and um, 4, negative 3. I think those are our co-vertices on the ellipse. So those are the vertices. And the next question is the foci. So those are your vertices. Foci. Um, you need to find c, and then the, our Pythagorean equation is going to be with c squared by itself. c squared equals a squared plus b squared c squared equals 4 plus 9, c squared equals 13, c equals the square root of 13. Um, the foci lie on the transverse axis, and so that's going to be between 3 and 4. So 1, 2, 1, 2, 3. So there they're going to be 1 there, and maybe 1 right there. And so they share the same y value as the center. So the foci are going to be negative 3 for the y value. And the x value, you're going to take this 2 on the center. The x value is going to be 2 plus root 13 and 2 minus root 13. So 2 plus or minus root 13. That gives me the foci. The last thing that we have to find happens to be the equations of both of those asymptotes. Both of those asymptotes have a point of 2, negative 3. And we might remember back to the point slope form of a line that looks like this. So we know that the point is 2, negative 3. And we know the slope. Slope is always going to be b over a. And you can check that out. I mean, you can actually count on the graph 3 over 2 or you can see that this is 3 over 2 and the other one's going to be minus so plus or minus 3 over 2 so to get the asymptotes I'm going to go y plus 3 equals 3 over 2 x minus 2 now of course the other one's going to look very similar except there's going to be a minus there and because I'm lazy I'm going to write the equations of the asymptotes like that and that completes problem number 22. Let's go ahead and do a few more problems. Okay, so how are we doing on time? You know, if this goes a little over, you can always stop at 90 minutes and say, okay, that's, that's where I'm stopping. But um, I'm going to do a few more problems. I think I'll do five more problems. And then that will complete this review. So here it goes. If we were in class, the review, we wouldn't cover as much in the review. And that would be too bad. But, you know, now that you're getting a video, you can stop it or move forward anytime you want. So let's go back to circles again. I'm just kind of making up these problems. So this is 7.2. I want you to find the standard equation of the circle that has a center of negative 1, 3, and the circle has to pass through, so I'll say passes through, the point 1, 2. Okay, so um, be ready for these kinds of questions. Our equation of the circle looks like this, x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. Well, the center, look, we already have h and k. 
So look at this. This is going to be x minus a negative 1, so x plus 1 squared plus y minus 3 squared, and then we don't know what r is. Okay, so some teachers would say, oh, take out the distance formula and do that and find out the distance between the center and a point on the circle, and then you'll know what r is. What I would do is I would just plug this point in to the circle. There's infinitely many points on a circle, and this is just one of them, so I'm going to plug this in for the x and the y. So this is going to be 1 plus 1 squared plus 2 minus 3 squared equals r squared. So this is 2 squared plus negative 1 squared equals r squared. 4 plus 1 equals r squared. It looks like r squared equals 5. r equals the square root of 5, but they never asked for that. Um, there was no instructions written at all, but I verbally said them. Write the standard form equation here, and so that's what I'm going to write, which is really this guy right here, but now we know what r squared is. It's 5. So the answer is going to be x plus 1 squared plus y minus 3 squared equals 5. So that completes this problem right here. Let's go do a similar problem, but from 7.2 that deals with a parabola. So, oh, 7.3. So 7.3 deals with a parabola. Okay, so this parabola has a vertex of 1, negative 4, and has a focus of negative 1, negative 4. And they want us to write the um, standard form equation of this parabola. Let's go ahead and draw a really rough sketch here. 1, negative 4, which is right here. So here's x, here's y, and then we have a focus of negative 1, negative 4. So here's the focus. So we know that the parabola is going to open to the left which makes it a y squared parabola. So y minus k squared equals 4p x minus h. The question is, hk, do we know what hk is? hk happens to be that right there. It happens to be the vertex of the parabola. So the other question is, do we know what p is? p is the directed distance from the vertex to the focus. And so what is that distance? It looks like distance of 2. So a lot of people say, oh, p is 2, but it's directed distance, which means it's going in the negative direction. It is negative 2. So let's plug those things into this equation. We have y, and we don't want to make the mistake of um, plugging in the focus. We want to plug this thing in here, and we want to go not y minus 1, but y plus 4 squared. And then we want to say this equals 4 times p x minus h, so x minus 1. So let's clean this up and box it. y plus 4 squared equals negative 8 x minus 1. And so there is the standard form equation of this parabola. Let's go ahead and do a one from 7.4, which is the ellipse. So 7.4, we are looking for the equation of the ellipse. Um, and what are we going to be looking for? Let's just give the vertices of this ellipse. So the vertices are 3, 2, and negative 5, 2. And the foci are 2, 2 and negative 4, 2. All ellipses look like this, x minus h squared all over a squared plus y minus k squared over b squared equals 1. So that's what all of our ellipses look like. Let's go ahead and do a rough sketch with this. 
here's x, here's y. Um, the vertices, 3, 2, and negative 5, 2. So this tells us a lot. This tells us what the center is. What is the halfway point between negative 5 and 3? The halfway point is negative 1. So that right there is the center. Center is negative 1, 2. And that actually tells us something. That tells us our h and our k. So we know what h and k are. We also know the distance from the center off to the right and off to the left onto the ellipse, that's going to be A. So A is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4. So A happens to be 4. So look at this. We know all of this stuff right here. We just have to figure out what B is. The vertices we have down. The foci, let's put down. The foci are at 2, 2 and negative 4, 2. And we know the distance from the center to a foci, or to a focus, happens to be C. So what is C? What's the distance from the center to one of those? Well, it looks like the distance is 3. Okay, so C is 3. And um, we know the top dog is A, because that's the thing that's on the major axis. And so we are going to go ahead and write our Pythagorean equation. a squared equals b squared plus c squared. And this is going to help us find what b is. So a squared is 16. This equals b squared plus c squared, which is 9. b squared equals 7. And that's all I really need to know because there's just a b squared there. So I have b squared. I know what a squared is and h and k. So let's go ahead and write up our answer. This is going to be x plus 1 squared all over a squared 16 plus y minus 2 squared over b squared and b squared is 7 this equals 1. There's our answer. Okay, for one more conic section problem like this and that's going to be a hyperbola. This is going to be something like you would see in 7.5. And so I'm going to give you the foci, which happen to be 0, plus or minus 6, and the length of the conjugate axis. is 10. Okay, go ahead and find the equation of this hyperbola, standard form equation. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and draw a picture here. When I draw the picture, I can see that I have um, 0 plus or minus 6. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. There's a focus. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. There's another one. Okay, and this is a hyperbola. Hopefully I wasn't saying any ellipse. So we do, this tells us a lot of stuff. It tells us where the center is. Where is the center of this hyperbola? The center is at 0, 0. So that there is my h, that there is my k. This hyperbola is going to open. It opens up down because the foci are right there which means what goes up and down the y-axis which means the y is going to be the one that is positive and b squared is always under y minus x minus h squared over a squared this equals one and we already know what h and k are so we could have just put y squared on the top and x squared on the top right there 
Okay, do I know anything else? Well, I know the length of the conjugate axis. The length of the conjugate axis, that's the axis I draw when I um, do the rectangle. Um, so the length of that, if I go 5 that way and 5 that way, there's the, there's the conjugate axis. Well, the conjugate axis lies, you know, here's the center and there's the conjugate axis. I have to run 5 to the right and run 5 to the left. So when I'm running left and right from the center, that tells me that A is 5. Okay, so we're getting somewhere. We also know because from the center to a focus is 6, that that's what C is going to equal. C is going to equal 6. And I know my Pythagorean equation, C rules, so C is by himself, C squared equals A squared plus B squared. C squared equals, well, wait, what am I doing? Here, I'll do this here, so no one will know that I, I messed up. Not obvious at all. So C squared is, whoops, 36 equals 25 plus b squared b squared equals 11 b equals the square root of 11 so i have b squared i have a squared which is 25 and 0 0 so let's write up our final answer it's going to be y squared h and k are 0 over b squared minus x squared over a squared and this is going to equal 1. That gives me the answer. So now we're going to do a problem from 11.10. Um, here it is. So this says x equals 3t minus 1 and y equals t plus 5. What do they want us to do with this parametric system of equations here. They want us to graph this. Oh, let me finish up the problem. T is greater than or equal to 1. Okay, so here's the problem right here. We're supposed to graph it and write the rectangular equation. Okay, so how? what am I going to do? What I'm going to do is I'm going to do this. And I'm going to put T equals 1 in and see what, what X and Y values I get. So if I put t equals 1 in for up here, I'll get x is 3 minus 1, which is 2. And then 1 right here, this would give me a y equals 6. Now because these are both linear, they both look like lines, we are actually going to have a line for our answer. And it's not, actually not going to be a line. It's going to start at time 1 and go on. So it's not going to be a line or a line segment. It's going to be something called a ray. Okay, so let's go ahead and put our axes. We have the point 2, 6, so that's why I'm kind of putting it like that. So here's x, here's y, here's 2, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, so there's 2, 6. Put a point right there. Because that's going to be where time starts. So now, wherever I go, that's where I'm going to draw the, the ray. I'm going to see what happens at time equals 2. When I put 2 in for t, I end up getting 6 minus 1, which is 5, and then 2 plus 5 is 7. So I'm going to go 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then the y-coordinate is 7. So it looks like this. Ah, boy. Okay, so that's what the line looks like. But boy, did I mess up. So this was time equals 1, and this is time equals 2. And this says t has to be greater than or equal to 1. I mean, so time equals 0 is probably like right here. We don't want that. So now I've got my white out. It's going to be more obvious what's happening here. should get a new one because I'm always like... Uh, maybe, maybe not. Look at that. You must have heard me. I was like, don't, don't replace me. Okay, so look at that. 
And so that is what it looks like. It starts there at time equals one, and then it goes that direction. Okay, so there's the graph with the orientation included. Now they want the rectangular equation. So you could say, oh, well, you know what? I will find out what the slope is and I will do it that way and then try to find the y-intercept. Or you could say I've got a line that goes through the two points. We go through the two points, two, six, and five, seven, and we're trying to find that line. Well, I mean, you can see, I mean, if, if you don't want to go through this completely, y equals mx plus b, you can see that the slope is three. You can go rise over one. The slope is not three. The slope is one third. Okay, so you can see that the slope is one third and plug it right into here. Now, if you didn't want to see that, you didn't want to do the problem that way, you can um, find the slope between those two points by going um, rise over run y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 and get one third. So now I'm going to go ahead and plug maybe the first point in there and see what I end up getting. 6 equals um, 1 third times x, so that's 2 thirds plus b. b equals 6 minus 2 thirds is 5 and a third or 16 thirds. Okay, so both are acceptable. And that, when I, when I actually drew it there, it did look like it went through 5 and a third. So when they ask for the rectangular equation, you're going to go y equals 1 third x plus 16 over 3. And we're not going to um, say that that is it. We have to limit our domain. Our domain starts where? At two. So we're going to say x is greater than or equal to two. So this is an example of a parametric equation and um, I think I've covered all the sections on this review. Study hard and take care of yourselves.